Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for building your family caregiver toolkit, supporting a loved one with depression. I'm Calvin Hu with Family Caregiver Alliance. And before we get started, I'd like to say a few words about our organization. Family Caregiver Alliance has been working in the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well being and then the quality of life of family caregivers. We offer support by providing a number of services and resources including consultations, classes, workshops, publications, and we also do advocacy work both locally and nationally. To learn more about Family Caregiver Alliance, please visit us at caregiver.org. Now for the webinar, your mics or um, phones are gonna be muted. So if you have any questions, you can use them by asking, by using the Q&A box on your screen and we will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Also, at the end of the webinar, uh, I'll be asking if you could provide a little bit of feedback. So I'd like to thank you all in advance for filling that out. Today, I'd like to welcome our guests, Susan Weinstein um, and Ariel Cohen. Susan is co-executive director at Families for Depression Awareness and is responsible for programs and finances. She was diagnosed with depression in her teens and draws upon her personal experience to uh, inform families for depression awareness curriculum. She also holds several volunteer positions, including serving on the executive committee and as governance committee chair of the Massachusetts Coalition for Suicide Prevention. She also holds a number of elected and appointed seats in her town government and is a native of South Florida. Susan is a graduate of Wellesley College and Boston University School of Law. Um, our other speaker is um, Ariel Cohen. She is the programs manager with Families for Depression Awareness. Uh, Ariel's passion for mental health advocacy stems from experiences, uh, sorry, experience with a diagnosis of depression and the loss of a family member to suicide. Um, Ariel provided oversight to Families for Depression Awareness programs, volunteers, social media, and is a trained facilitator in the alternatives to suicide approach with the Wildflyer Wildflower Alliance. She's a graduate of Westfield State University and earned her master's of social work with a concentration in mental health from Boston College. So now that you know a little bit more about today's guests, I'd like to turn things over to um, Susan. Thanks so much, Calvin, and hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to have this chance to talk with you a little bit about uh, supporting a loved one who lives with depression. And uh, we put together some strategies and some resources that together we call your caregiver toolkit. Uh, so let's just take a quick look at the agenda. We'll first spend a couple of minutes talking about Families for Depression Awareness, and then we'll go into more detail about building your toolkit. We'll then um, work with Calvin on some questions and answers. And then we'll wrap up. So we should be finished uh, right about three o'clock. Our time was just the East Coast, but about one hour from now, wherever you happen to be. So um, about Families for Depression Awareness, we're um, based in Waltham, Massachusetts. We have uh, staff in Nashville, Tennessee as well. We've been around since 2001 and we help families recognize and cope with depression and bipolar disorder to get people well and prevent suicides. And one of the things that's really critical to our thinking is that we believe that um, mood disorders, depression and bipolar disorder, basically affect everyone in a family. If one person has depression, it's gonna impact everybody in some way. You know, if it's a parent, then maybe their kid is gonna be more predisposed to have uh, a mood disorder themselves. If, um, again, if it's a parent, then maybe another person in the household has to pick up some of the caregiving, the household chores, you know, whatever it happens to be. But uh, depression has an impact on everyone. It's really felt in different ways by different people. But um, we believe that, you know, everyone in the family deserves to have their needs recognized and taken care of, addressed in some way. Um, Ari, I'm not seeing the slides move, so if that's... They're moving. We're on the website slide now. Awesome, because mine is just showing the same thing. So <laughs> so sorry about that. I'll wing it. Um, all good, all good. It's, you know, 
I'm familiar with our stuff, so that's good. Um, so I hope you'll have a chance to visit our website. We're at familyaware.org. We're very excited that within the past, I don't know, couple of weeks, we've launched a new website. There are still a few things we're working out, but we hope that we've made our vast resources a, a lot easier for you to find and use. But um, webinars on a lot of different topics, a lot of educational material, hopefully some inspiration. We've always been an organization that has uh, relied on storytelling from lived experience to help people understand what it's like to have depression, what it's like to have bipolar disorder, what it's like to live with people who have those disorders, and um, also what it's like to you know, continue your life if you've lost someone to suicide. Uh, we were among the first organizations, if not the first mental health organization, to feature real people telling their own stories. And it's a tradition that we've continued to this day. It's just really important to us that people understand that they're not alone in their dealing with hard times around mental health and um, to get uh, reassured and inspired. Uh, a really key thing about our um, website is that we've, we have some free online tests. We don't keep the results of any of them, so you could do it without worrying about anybody on our end looking over your shoulder, but the depression and bipolar screening test is a, a good quick tool to sort of get where you are on the standard measures of depression and bipolar disorder. And sometimes you can also take it, you know, imagining you're the person that you're concerned about and see if your uh, concerns are uh, rooted with them, you know, maybe experiencing depression. But the other one is the caregiver stress test. And I don't think you need us to tell you that you're a caregiver and you're stressed. But what we do want you to know is that there's a way of measuring your level of stress. And more importantly, there are ways to manage it. And so uh, it reports to you, you know, the sort of range of um, uh, stress level that you're experiencing, but also points you to some strategies and some resources for trying to get a handle on that. And then finally, we also have um, publications. Uh, we used to have a a brochure that we called uh, Helping Someone Who Is Depressed. Uh, and I cringe at that because that's just not the way we speak anymore. But it was about 20 pages. And then we decided to redo it. And we ended up with our 60-page caregiver handbook. And it's just chock full of all sorts of good information for people. Because um, we're really about providing education and what we call actionable advice. We want caregivers to feel like they are equipped and ready to advocate for their loved ones, to, to talk with their loved ones about getting care, and to working to ensure that their loved ones are getting the support and care they need to get well. Um, and again, uh, our publications primarily have education, but almost all of them also include the personal story component because it is important to us. All right, uh, let me turn it over to Ari. Thanks, Susan, and hello, everyone. We're here today to talk to you about building your family caregiver toolkit. And so I'm going to drop in the chat your very own toolkit that you can download. And our hope today is not that you sit here and fill it out necessarily during the program, but we're going to go through the different parts of caregiving that we think help create a foundation for you to be effective with your loved ones. We know that it can be really overwhelming to sit around and look for the information that supports you and your family. So we've created this simple toolkit as a foundation for you to fill out your workbook and go back to and reference over time. So in that toolkit, we talk about six caregiver tools. We're going to go over self-care strategies, how to set realistic expectations, how to define your role supporting your loved one, resources that you need to get all of this work done, effective communication skills, as well as how to have a family action plan. So that was me very briefly. Susan, anything you want to add before you get into caregiver tool number one? No, I can hop right into tool number one. Self-care strategies. Um, hopefully everyone on this line knows about self-care and why it's important, but let's just briefly touch on that. Um, it is uh, almost impossible to do a good job taking care of someone else if you are not taking care of yourself first. 
the analogy that a lot of people use is the mask coming down on the airplane, you know, the oxygen mask that you're supposed to put it on yourself first uh, before you help anybody else. That's to ensure that you are getting oxygen, that your brain and your body are getting that kind of nutrition that it needs in order to function. But, you know, it, it can also be like, you can't pour from an empty cup. You can't drive on an empty tank. You know, whatever the, the images that appeals to you, whatever resonates with you, let's latch on to that and, um, and use that as inspiration. But self-care is something that you do intentionally or deliberately that you enjoy doing or gives you a sense of satisfaction when you've done it. Uh, I like to think of it as nourishing yourself, that you are providing yourself with some sort of activity or uh, inspiration or uh, experience that makes you feel more of yourself, that you are, um, you do a lot of giving back, but you need to give to yourself too. So we're looking for people to find that balance between giving of yourself to others and giving to yourself so that you can be your own person, but also be there for other people. And one of the ways that we look at that is uh, we often come across people who say, you know, I just can't take the time for that. If I, if I do something for myself, uh, that's being selfish. And, and we want you to really reframe that and to look at it as being self-full, that you are fulfilling your own needs um, as a way of being there for others too, in addition to your being there for yourself. And when we talk about self-care, we're not, I mean, some people, sure, maybe it means a day at the spa, but that's really not what we're talking about. We're talking about something you can do pretty easily and with some regularity um, so that you feel good. You know, it, care, I don't have to tell you, caregiving is hard. It's really challenging. It's hard to keep up your energy. It's hard to keep up your focus. There are a lot of demands on your time and attention. And you need to take that moment or hour or whatever it happens to be and give yourself a break. Let yourself breathe, let yourself reflect. Um, so that's our plug that it's just really important. Uh, we see that there are um, uh, some um, foundational elements to self-care and it, you know, it's about you being well. And we look at it as an acronym of SEAM, which is sleep, eating, exercise, and meditation. And for me, I know when someone says exercise, I'm like, yeah, right. That's just not my thing. But I, but I do give myself a little bit of credit that, that the things that I do are not necessarily what other people might consider exercise. I mean, I'm not going out there. I'm not running marathons. I'm not jogging, which I hate. Um, but I am getting some fresh air. I am stretching my legs. I, you know, I, I am trying to, you know, do a little bit of, you know, higher level heart rate. But um, I, I find it so much easier to tell other people what to do than to do it myself. But I also need to give myself some compassion that I do have a busy life and I do care for a lot of things and I got a lot of stuff on my plate. Um, so all I can ask of myself and I think all of you can ask of yourself is do the best you can. So when we talk about getting sleep, you know, you know, maybe you're not one of those people who's able to work in whatever the recommended amount is. I am not a big person on that anyway, but, but try to make it count. Uh, whatever hours you have, try and make them count. Give yourself a break by trying to wind down, put your screen away uh, a little bit before it's time to go to bed. Uh, just let your body have a little bit of time so that when you do hit the pillow, you're ready to sleep. Uh, eating, you know, we don't all have access to awesome foods every day. And in fact, some people really struggle to put food on the table, but again, you're doing the best you can. So when you can access some food that is considered healthy, then, you know, relish it, enjoy it. Uh, and otherwise, um, you know, just uh, eat what you can when you can. And if uh, finding food is hard for you, then find, you know, some uh, resources in your community that can help with that. Exercise, I've talked about already, but, you know, I guess the thing is you really try and make it a regular thing. And I know for some people, what really helps is um, to make it accountable that you can partner up with a friend or someone in your neighborhood. So maybe that means that you guys meet up and you go walking around. 
but maybe it also means that in order for you to be able to exercise, you need someone to keep an eye on things at home. And so maybe your partner is willing to spend the hour and a half there with your family, you know, whatever it happens to be while you go do something for you. And then you can um, return the favor for them. And then that way you both get something out of it. Plus you feel like you're helping somebody in a way that, you know, is immediately rewarding as opposed to a lot of caregiving, which is hard to, you know, day to day, see what, what you're accomplishing. And then finally, you know, getting out in nature, having a little mindfulness, um, uh, a little self-reflection, a little self-inspiration, you know, whatever it is. And then what you want to do is make sure that you are seeing yourself as a whole person. You're not, you're not one dimensional. You are not just the caregiver you are, um, which is an important part of you. I am entirely sure, but you are also someone who has, you know, your own emotional sides, your own need for connectedness, your own uh, professional um, uh, aspects, your spiritual aspects, you know, you're a multidimensional person. So when you think about your self-care, what are ways that you can nourish these different parts of yourself? Um, and then one of the really key things is um, boundaries. This is like probably the best kind of self-care that you can do in a regular way that, you know, if someone is really frustrating you or getting you really angry, chances are that they're pushing one of your buttons, that, they're, that they are uh, going over one of the boundaries that you've tried to set. And if you've communicated it to them and they are doing that, then it's time for you to, uh, you know, check in with that. Uh, and to say, you know, I need you to stop that now. Let's talk about this is something that's important to me. But, you know, just really protect yourself from those kinds of um, intrusions, I guess. And if you're having trouble with that, then um, you need to know that um, you do not have to have a diagnosable mental health condition to have benefit from going to see a therapist. And if someone in your family is reluctant to see a therapist, then you going to see a therapist can be a good model for them to hop on and do it for themselves too. Okay, I've just talked a really long time. Are you have anything you want to throw? <laughs> We're just having a little bit of technical difficulty with the toolkit. So I apologize that I may have missed some of the things. Um, but for folks that say the link isn't working, it does not open into um, like a, a browser. It's going to come a download onto your computer. So if you have a pop-up blocker, it may not be allowing you to open it. So just check on those things. Um, and then worst case, we can try to drop it in as a file as well. Um, but I would just underscore that, and, and Susan may have said this a little bit, but for folks who may be joining us, that we hear often from caregivers that they don't have enough time for their own self-care, and you absolutely have to make that time, otherwise you may experience burnout or at worst your own depression. So really underscoring the importance of self-care. And in the toolkit, we have a little 30-day um, challenge where if you are looking for new ideas or you're not quite sure where to start, you could try to pick some that might feel like a good fit and see what works for you. So we'll move on to caregiver tool number two, which I think is one of the most important aspects, and that's realistic expectations. I'm sure many of you can relate to offering a suggestion to your loved one only to be met with, that's not what I need right now, or frustration, or even anger. And as a caregiver, it can be deflating, and it could make you not want to help or pull back. And so we want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So I want to help but think of this quote from Pat Deegan, help isn't help if it doesn't help, right? So if I think my loved one needs to go to therapy, but they're not ready, I shouldn't be focusing on that quite yet. I can think with my loved one, what would be helpful? What do they need right now? So the way that we put this into action is thinking about the model of the stages of change. And for the sake of time, we're not going to go deep into what the stages of change is. Um, but as you can see on the side, we do have a link to our website where you can watch our series to learn about each stage. But a, big, a quick overview is that the stages of change is about the process it takes for a person to make a uh, 
change themselves. As you know, change does not happen overnight and healing is, isn't a linear process. So if you your loved one is doing really well one day and then the next they are not doing well, it's expected that this can happen. So by understanding that change is a process and getting a sense of where your loved one is in that process, it sets both you and your loved one up for better intentions, better success. So you can see here on the slide, um, and if you can't, I'll describe what it looks like. There are different circles with different stages that all interrelate to one another, which shows us that we might jump around from stage to stage. And in the middle, we can see that relapse is an expected part of the process of change. You may think about one step forward, two steps back, but it's really two steps forward and one step back. If our loved one takes the slide and they were doing really well and all of a sudden they're back in relapse, it doesn't mean that all of our hard work went out the window. It just means that something that was supporting them is no longer doing that. So an example is if your loved one was, you know, in therapy and they were really clicking with their therapist, but all of a sudden things are really struggling, maybe that therapist no longer works for them and they need to start looking for a new therapist. Or maybe the medication that they were on is no longer working and they need to start trying other medications. So really understanding where your loved one is can help with that process. So pre-contemplation, which is often where your loved one may be when you're trying to get them help and they're not quite ready for it, it means that they're not even realizing that there is an issue. And so as a caregiver, we can carefully help them understand that there might be something bigger going on here. You know, you may think that it's normal to sleep in all the time, but that hasn't been normal for you. And I've noticed that you haven't um, been able to keep up with hygiene as much, or it's been harder for you to get to work lately. And so we can carefully start to help our loved one through this process. Um, the video series that we offer on our website can help you understand at, at each stage what kinds of things as a caregiver that you could be doing to encourage your loved one's wellness. All this to say, we don't expect you to have a clipboard to be thinking about each stage and you know measuring these things of what your loved one is doing, but really just reflecting and understanding the concept as a whole can give you both a little bit of grace and understanding when things aren't going perfectly or we take a step back in our wellness. Susan, anything that you would add to that one? Uh, only that it's sometimes a hard thing to really get your head around. I think that the video helps, but um, the change that, that we're generally thinking about when we're looking at this model is the change of them accepting that they have um, an issue that needs um, attention. So it's not as straightforward as it might seem. It's a little hard to conceptualize, but just the idea is, I, mean, I think people generally know that it doesn't really work to force treatment on someone if they're not ready for it. And that's, I think that's really what this distills down to. Thank you, Susan. I think we're good to move on to caregiver tool number three. Defining your role? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ari was just talking about expectations, and I think one thing that's really important um, for people who have not experienced depression themselves, it's almost hard to have an expectation of what depression is going to mean for your loved one. And so let me just tell you, no, um, uh, depression, one of the key uh, ways that depression is diagnosed is how it impairs functioning. And if you just think about that, what it's saying is your loved one is not dealing with life, is not um, living life in the same way that they did before they had depression. And for a lot of people, this can be physical symptoms that they manifest. So stomach aches, headaches, um, uh, phantom pains, uh, all kinds of things like that. Uh, uh, gastrointestinal problems, uh, migraines. Uh, it can also, for many people, a real sign is that depression affects your thinking. And it does this in several different ways, but the ways that you might see it is your loved one isn't organized uh, anymore. They've lost things. Um, they can't make decisions. They can't think things through. Um, and they can't remember things as I sit here trying to remember things. Uh, 
Uh, but depression also really can affect a person's motivation. You think about it. If you really don't value yourself as a human being, if you don't think that you have worth to yourself or others, there's not really any reason for you to be living, you can understand why it's really hard to motivate. Uh, and so someone who is a caregiver for a person with depression, particularly with se severe depression, you know, there's a lot to deal with. So the expectations that you might have of them based on their life before depression, uh, maybe you can hold that as uh, a hope for after their depression is treated. But I think that your, your expectations are going to be really challenged if you don't adjust them to uh, where your loved one is with their depression at the time. So knowing that so much of their mood and behaviors and functionalities are gonna be affected can help you better understand how you might be able to support them um, as they go through this. You know, it may be as Ari was just talking about, helping them to recognize that there really is something going on that needs attention, you know, just that they don't know it's an issue, but when they do, they might just not know what to do about it. They might, uh, they might be reluctant to see somebody or they might be stymied in, in, it's overwhelming to try and find a provider. So that's a place where you could be a real support to them is, you know, doing the legwork to find, you know, who are, providers in the insurance network who's, you know, who are taking clients, you know, there's, there's a lot of things to go through and it's a lot of steps for someone who's having trouble thinking. So uh, you could be really helpful with that. You want to help them. Uh, basically it boils down to uh, get quality care and um, figure out how to pay for it. But whether that's evaluating treatment options, whether that's um, you know, coordinating with them on their appointments and how to get there or, you know, taking care of the kids while, uh, while they're off getting care. For someone who has depression, if you ask them, how's it, well, if their provider asks them, how's it been going the last couple of weeks since I saw you last? Someone with depression may not be able to see back past the last 24 or 48 hours. So if you've been interacting with them and you can say, you know, uh, about a week ago, you actually got together with some friends and that seemed like a really big thing for you to do. Or, you know, I've been noticing that uh, this, since you've been on this medication, uh, it seems like you've been a bit more irritable and maybe that's something you can talk with the doctor about. Uh, you know, there are ways that you can talk with them and provide some clues to um, insights that they just aren't having. Um, so the big thing about providing the support is that you want to be doing this with them, uh, not instead of them, uh, it's like with, not for. So to the extent that your loved one can be making decisions and taking actions, you want to support them in doing those. But when they can't, you want to be there to help them get the things done that need to be done. Uh, okay, to move on to the next one, Ari? Yeah, and I'm actually just working on getting another link for the toolkit for folks that is through Google Drive because people are having trouble with the bit.ly link. So I will be working on that in, okay. as you finish this up. Okay, great. Um, so um, I would just say to wind that up, um, well, we'll go on to, to tool number four. Um, Again, I'm still just seeing the front page, so I'm trusting that you're doing that. Oh, it's there for you. <laughs> okay, good. Woo! Um, yeah, it's very weird that we're not visible and that I can't see, <laughs> but, but it's good. We're a team. Speaking of teams, <laughs> um, in talking about resources, one of the things that we think about is caregivers as being lifelong learners. You know, information about depression, there's a, there's a core bit of knowledge that you can get, but thankfully, you know, there are, there are um, new treatments that come out, not as often as we would like, but nonetheless, 
Um, there may be different strategies that come out for supporting people. Um, so we like to really encourage people to learn about depression. Uh, you can get started on a website. There's certainly many places you can learn about depression on the internet. Uh, we focus more on caregiving around depression as opposed to, you know, the ins and outs of depression itself, but we do have a good webinar. Uh, we also have another webinar coming up in the fall about treatment. Um, but, you know, learn the basics, really get familiar with the disorder, get familiar with what the options are for treatment. One of the things that you can do to really support your loved one is be able to help them work through, you know, what are the what are the things that are important to them through the treatment process so that you can really be there to support them in, in getting those? Like if the most important thing for them is to clear up their brain so that they can be thinking better, you know, there are some medications that are better for that, for that than others. Some people would really prefer to try other things to medication uh, first, uh, you know, support them in uh, discussing that with their mental health provider, their medical provider, uh, to see if that's uh, a reasonable choice. Uh, maybe something like a short course of medication would make more sense, who knows? So um, uh, being able to ask the questions and to support them and getting the information can be really helpful. Um, and just know that um, information isn't static. Sorry, yes, uh, it's dynamic. So uh, just, you know, I'm not saying you have to put on a Google alert, but check every once in a while, you know, if your loved one has a an appointment that's coming up, then maybe it's a chance to just check in and see uh, what the news is about treatment. Um, so education is the first thing we talk about. Um, <clears throat> second thing, uh, treatment team. Uh, we like to think of this, as I was just saying, as a team. You know, you're all wanting to work together to achieve a common goal, and that is for your loved one to be well and functioning and feeling good. Uh, and to being, you know, involved in their life in the same way that they were or, you know, something similar. So uh, you can help them find their provider or providers, you know, maybe that's uh, a medical provider, maybe it's also a therapist, um, but you and your loved one working together with these professionals, I mean, it could also be a care coordinator, depending, <clears throat> um, but just so that they have their team. Now, your loved one needs support, but you should have support too. So the support network is for you. It's the people who can help you stay well and um, maybe chip in when you need extra support. So maybe that's neighbors, maybe that's friends, maybe that's family, you know, whoever it is that can um, be the support to you that you need. Um, understand about paying for treatment. Not everyone has insurance. Not all insurance does a great job of covering mental health care. Although it's an, if it's an Affordable Care Act compliant plan, it should be, you know, at least baseline good. So um, uh, insurance has a lot of jargon. And again, if someone is not really interested in their own life or isn't thinking very clearly, it can be a real bear to get through uh, what's covered, what isn't, who's in the network, who isn't. And those are the kinds of things that you can really be supportive about. Uh, when we talk about paying for treatment, it's not necessarily that you need to open up your wallet. Um, it's sorting out what resources are available to your loved one and um, what can get covered by someone other than you unless that's something that you are willing and able to do. But you can help your loved one keep track of expenses and um, you know there are some providers that that don't take insurance, but maybe the insurance company will reimburse uh, if you pay out of pocket. So, you know, keeping track of those kinds of things. But you want to make sure that they are receiving the care that they need, and hopefully it's in a cost-effective way. Um, and then um, legal considerations is like a whole thing unto itself, but we like to recommend that people who are dealing with mental health issues, that they have a uh, advanced care directive about mental health, so that if something comes up and they need care, um, but they're not necessarily uh, in a good place to make decisions about it, it's already been discussed. It's already been laid out who needs to do what and when. Um, and it's something that a lot of mental health providers are willing to work with you on. Um, and also just as a 
minimum, I think everybody should have a healthcare proxy so that if you're not able to make decisions for yourself, then uh, you've designated someone who knows you, who can do that for you, um, only while you're unable to do it. And then connecting with your community, you want to have um, a sense of belonging. Depression can be really isolating for your loved one, but also for you. Um, as we started out saying, you know, you're not alone in this. There are people who are experiencing the same thing as you are, something very similar. But also there are people who have been through it and they want to um, support others who are going through that. They want to you know, share their experiences and what they've learned because you're not going to read about everything online and you also shouldn't believe everything you read online. So sometimes if you're sitting down with somebody and they can say, yeah, I've done that. Uh, let me tell you what it was like for me. Uh, then maybe you can draw some inspiration, some reassurance. Um, one thing that's uh, uh, hard to talk about for people is suicide. And uh, this isn't a program about suicide, but when you talk about depression, you have to understand that uh, untreated depression, you know, the, the worst consequence of it is that someone will take their life. And uh, there's not necessarily a way that you can always prevent that from happening, but there are things that you can do. And one of the ways that uh, people in suicide prevention look at it is that there are risk factors and there are protective factors. Risk factors are things like, you know, someone who's abusing substances or there's ready access to what we call lethal means. So, you know, a way that, that they would um, take their life, you know, whether it's a lot of pills in the medicine cabinet, whether it's a, an accessible firearm, you know, there are lots of ways that people can act on their uh, desire to end their life, but there are things that we can do to reduce their access to things that can kill them. Um, but, but for each of these risk factors, there are also protective factors. So while we're looking at reducing risk factors, we wanna be looking at ways that we can increase protective factors. A big part of that is helping them find ways to increase their coping skills, um, working with them on their uh, developing a sense of purpose and on their self-esteem. Some of these things come with effective treatment. You know, some of these they're going to be able to access through therapy, but others you can really support in your own home. You know, um, positive family involvement. Uh, if your um, religion discourages suicide, you know, that's something that you can um, cultivate. Uh, but also, you know, having favorable impressions of mental health care and accessing it so that it can be effective. Um, you know, this is just not a formula on whether or not someone's going to attempt to take their life, but there are, but these are ways that you can work to make it less likely that they will attempt to take their life. So um, you can be cultivating an environment where your loved one is more likely to have the skills, the relationships, you know, the stability and the self-identity that will work together to prevent a suicide attempt. So um, think about ways that you can increase the positives and reduce the negatives. And um, I see a lot of really uh, important things coming up in the chat. And I, I wanna just recognize that stigma can be a really big barrier to folks getting the treatment that they need. And I know for caregivers can be so frustrating when something like an advanced directive or medication feels like it could be so helpful. So really meeting the person where they're at and spending that time in these difficult conversations with them. And I think this can be a great place for support groups or if they are connected to their religious community or whatever that is for that person to really help them explore in a way that feels safe to them. There's also certified peer specialists that are being more and more accessible and involved in, you know, more traditional means of mental health care. And that can be a great way for folks who have been in the psychiatric facilities or in the system um, to talk about their own experiences, positive and negative, and really support your loved one. There's also something called warm lines. If you're not familiar with that, it's a little different than um, a crisis prevention line. And warm lines are typically more for if you just really need to someone to talk to. And this can also be great for you or your loved one where they want to 
talk with someone, but they're a little bit worried about potential for, um, you know, a police involvement or for someone to escalate the call in a way that they're not interested in. So really thinking about these alternative, uh, you know, resources that are available. And so while we're thinking about this, how we communicate with our loved one is so important. I'm sure we all get frustrated and say things we wish we didn't say. Um, so really having intention in this area is so important. Um, we go over a number of resources, but also on our website, we do have two longer programs, webinars that are free, one focused on communicating with teens and one focused on communicating with adults. So if you really want to work on this a little bit more, I encourage you to go check those out. Um, but we'll introduce a few concepts here. So you may be familiar with the term active listening, and that may feel like giving you know, eye contact and nodding along, which is definitely a part of active listening. But one of my colleagues likes to say that you're listening to learn, not listening to respond. And so if you're listening to someone and you're also trying to formulate how you are going to respond to them, that's not active listening. It's actually okay for you to take a second after someone finishes their statement. You know, you can even say, actually, let me think about what I, I want to say to respond to that and then process and, and give them a response. It's also important to validate your loved one. Um, you may not agree with them, and that's okay. And it can feel like if I validate what they're saying, that I'm agreeing with what they're saying, but that is not the case. Validating can actually open up a window of conversation so much more. So if your loved one is saying, you know, I think the world's against me, there's no reason to be here, you may want to jump into that fixer mode and say, no, that's not true. But that is true for your loved one right now. And so to validate, you know, I hear you saying things. Things are really hard. I can understand feeling that way and wanting to give up. Would you talk to me a little bit more about that? Can open up a lot more um, rather than just telling them, no, no, that's not the way it is. So being non-judgmental and compassionate can go a long way. We like to call that being respectfully curious. And one way that could look is, you know, if, if your loved one does something that you don't agree with, you may um, say, you know, why would you do that? Or, you know, you may be well-intentioned and say, why did you do that? But oftentimes, why questions can put someone on the defensive. So instead, if I say, what happened that led to this? Or how, how did this happen? Um, it can help open these things up a little bit more. You know, what led us to where we are today um, can help people recognize, oh, this person wants to hear what I have to say versus, you know, they think I did something wrong. So these are little pieces that might help open up a conversation a little bit more. Also using I statement, which can be really hard. So rather than saying you don't do enough around the house or you need to take that medication, you know, I'm really worried about you when we're not able to follow through on medication. I'm worried that, you know, your depression symptoms might come back. I think the medication really helps you. Is this something that we could talk about a little bit? You know, I have noticed that you're sleeping in a lot more and you're not interested in hanging out with your friends as much. Have you noticed that that's, you know, happening for you? Do you think something bigger could be going on? So really using these I statements, we're thinking about, you know, how it's affecting you, not in a way that you're putting more pressure on them, but showing them that it matters to you, that um, you're there for them as well. And being consistent with that outreach. I know a lot of folks don't live with their loved ones necessarily. Um, and so they might not be responsive to you. Maybe they're not picking up your calls. And so it's okay to continue to reach out to them, you know, maybe not five times in a row within five minutes, uh, but every day, you know, sending a little text or a little reminder and being creative, not just necessarily focusing on what's wrong, but focusing on what's right, what your loved one likes and enjoys. So we know one family caregiver, her story is actually on our YouTube channel, um, Nancy, where her um, adult son just really wasn't responsive and so she would send him like a little joke or a little gif or a little meme, something lighthearted. And over time, uh, he started to feel more comfortable. And, and this just showed him that she was thinking about him, that she was there for him and would be there anytime. That said, it is important to follow through with what you say you're going to do. And this is a key place where you can build trust with your loved one. If that's something that you don't quite have yet or something that you want to work on, 
when you say that you're going to do something, it's really important that you then go and do that. However, we're human beings and sometimes life gets in the way. Things happen. You have your own crises that occur. And so that's where we need to come to our loved one and be transparent, not brush them off and say, no, no, I know I said I'd do that. I'll get to it. But say, you know, you're right. I did say I would do that. I'm, I'm really sorry this came up, but I put a reminder on my phone. I'm going to do it this afternoon at one o'clock. Would you want to sit next to me while I make that call for you? I know I promised that I would go refill your prescription. And I understand that it's scary that I'm waiting till the last minute. I would be frustrated too. I'm going to go do that right now. I'm so sorry. So even if we aren't able to follow through in that moment, it's important that we also offer, you know, role modeling what, you know, forgiveness and role modeling that we're human and, and everybody makes mistakes. And this last piece, um, stopping conversations that escalate, you know, hopefully before you get to this point, you've agreed on different terms that, you know, if we're yelling at each other, if we're swearing, that's when we should, you know, both stop the conversation, take some time away. Um, but as Susan talked about earlier, knowing those boundaries, you know, our loved one has depression, so they might not have the capacity to speak perfectly calmly. Um, you know, maybe they they are going to have a little bit of a tone and we can be flexible with that. But there may be hard stops where we're not going to be called names or, you know, if we're screaming, that's a time we both need to go take a, a minute to breathe. And this is a place where a code word can help both of you. You know, maybe the it's a silly word that helps break the tension a little bit. Hey, we're, it's getting a little bananas over here. I think it's time to step away from each other. Something that, you know, helps you both know that this is not the time. And so really taking your loved one's lead. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, like eye contact, but sometimes eye contact is not necessarily something that someone does in their culture or for sometimes with teens, making that eye contact just feels a little bit too intense. So it can be okay to sit side by side, sometimes in the car, on a picnic bench. It's okay if your loved one's not necessarily able to make that eye contact when you're talking, but you know, really trying to connect. And while I know that texting or emailing can be a little difficult, sometimes actually writing it down can be cathartic. Um, I know when my loved one and I are having a tough time and we're in the middle of a kind of a bigger fight, I'm able to go and journal and it actually helps me process a little bit better. And then I can come back and say, hey, I actually realized that I could have said that a little bit differently. You know, I'm sorry for X, Y, or Z. And so these are some strategies that might help. And again, um, in the toolkit, we sort of offer a little list of them. You could think about what ones you may already be doing really well and what areas you'd like to work on for yourself and your loved one. Susan, anything to add before I go over to the family action plan? Nope, gone. All right. So this last little piece here quickly is now you have all this information. What do we do about it? And I saw some great questions in the chat, you know, thinking about how do I find a new provider? You know, how do I get these things covered? This is really overwhelming. Well, this family action plan can help you break down those steps a little bit more. So it helps you identify what is that main problem that's going on? You know, maybe there's 10 of them, but let's pick one that we're really going to focus on today. You know, what are the questions that we have about it? How do we go get those answers? Who can help me find those answers? answers. When are we going to get back together as a family to talk about this again and make sure we all follow through? So in the toolkit that's linked, it's also on our website, familyaware.org slash action plan. Um, there's a little video on our YouTube channel sort of walking you through the plan itself as well. Um, and this is something that you can do with or without your family member. We always encourage having the person with depression involved in all decision making, but sometimes they're just not able to be there. And so gathering as as a family or their um, support team to think through what we can do. Um, and just to back up a little bit too, if your loved one's unwilling to go to therapy, if they're unwilling to do some of these pieces, you as the caregiver could start that. And then when your loved one's ready, you may already have that relationship set up or they can give you a referral. Or if you're already seeing a family counselor, then your loved one would be able to join. So you don't always have to wait for your loved one to take the first step for you all to step toward wellness. So that's that's our program, and now we're going to open it up to uh, any questions. So Calvin, if there's some that stood out to you that you want to send our way, and if folks want to add more to the Q&A or in the chat, we have the next about 10 minutes to keep going. Thanks. Yeah, actually, um, one question just came up that um, we we're just, um, are you just talking about? This is a caregiver um, who could, I guess, use some additional advice. Um, they use active listening, validating statements, but the person they're caring for, their loved one has um, is living with depression, uh, becomes even more frustrated and irritated. 
And I guess maybe a little bit of background is the um, family member is older, so perhaps a parent or grandparent, and the person who is providing care is younger, so maybe they're a, a young adult, maybe in the 20s or possibly 30s if someone's quite a bit older. So do you have any advice on maybe some additional techniques to help them communicate with their loved one and, and work together while, while still um, um, seeing, seeing kind of eye to eye? Yeah, the, the first thing that came to mind, and I, I wanted to say earlier too, is as like an older adult, losing your independence is so frustrating and hard to be dependent on other people. And then, you know, the child that you raised to be giving you advice, that's that's such a difficult thing and, and you know, coming to terms with that. Um, and so when I used to work with clients who are losing capacity, I often talked about this shifting you know, spectrum of what is independence. You know, it's still independent for you to tell me what you need and for me to then go do do that. I understand it's hard that you cannot do that for yourself anymore, but you can still tell me what the things are that you need. So really helping that if that may be an underlying piece for your family member, um, kind of exploring that a little bit um, and thinking through, you know, what's our dynamic now that, you know, I am an adult and I can help you in different ways. I know I used to be in, a, in the, the role that I needed the most help, but I want to pay you back. You know, I want to, you gave me so much when I was younger. I really want to pay that forward now and be that support you know it's time for you to relax a little bit and lean on me um and and, and it can be some personality pieces too i know that you know um my uh partners parents they never want to stop giving of themselves they've really you know my um almost mother-in-law she really can't move like she used to and we were moving recently and she was overexerting herself and you know we really had to physically stop her from doing those things and so sometimes it is hard and and difficult for you to take the brunt of that um, but we really have to make sure that our loved ones are safe as well. Susan did you want to add anything to that answer? Yeah I mean I think just the compassion piece uh, recognizing that this is hard for them you know they uh whether or not they know that they have depression is one factor. Um, but also, you know, ask questions. Like, um, you know, you make the statements, but also how can I, how can I help you? I mean, I, I know there are things that need to get done. What would be helpful to you? Hopefully that was helpful. Any other questions, Calvin? Yeah, you know, we had another question. Um, I'm not sure if this is exactly uh, applicable. So if that's the case, please let me know. But we had some listeners who want to know um, how they might determine if they are being supportive rather than being an enabler. I don't know if that's exactly um, uh, applicable, but we had a couple people wondering or feeling they, yeah. they wanted to help, but they might feel that maybe they're actually just supporting someone's um they're actually not being helpful even if that's what they're trying to do yeah that's such a good question and such a fine line i know that um i have an example from personal experience where when I was a depressed kid, my room used to be out of control and like I literally could not figure out how to clean it myself. And my mom would think, you know, why is my teenager, is my teenager taking advantage of me? You know, she should be able to clean her own room. Like, what's this about? Um, and really she would, you know, you know, eventually fold that we all wanted the room to be clean. Um, but what ended up happening was mom coming in the room and helping me figure out, okay, let's start by cleaning up the things on the floor. Okay, let's start by, you know, doing these pieces. And then slowly it became easier. Um, when someone has depression, as Susan mentioned, like cognitively, it's a little bit harder to organize and to remember. And so there actually really may be capacity pieces that just aren't there for them in that moment. Um, so really working with them and sometimes, you know, slowly scaling back, like, you know, why don't you try um, setting a reminder on your phone to take your medication, and then you're checking in to see if they really did take the medication. Um, you know, if I also know um, a mother daughter where, um, you know, she's an adult, the daughter, and her mom sends her a little emoji of a pill every morning with a question mark, you know, did you take your medication is the understanding. And this is agreed upon that this is something that the daughter appreciates. And then the daughter sends back the pill emoji with a little check mark to say, I did do it. And this has become a way for them to check in without either one feeling like they're being too invasive. Um, so it is, it is a very personal piece, um, but sort of working on 
and you know giving that person independence when possible um you know scaling back where you can because their ability will change over time and now you know i am aware that when my room is out of control that's pretty much a first sign that i'm not doing well like i need help from someone outside and so these can then become indicators to the person as well um, that something might be building up for them susan anything you would add to that no thank you you did great hopefully that was helpful Okay, I have another question. Um, and I guess I'm going to apologize beforehand because this is not something that could be answered very quickly. And the, the, the questioner also knows this, but they wondered if you have any tips for encouraging um, a family member, friend, loved one not to end their own life when they might be in a, uh, a place, a painful place. And then I guess I want to add on to that. Uh, you know, I guess hypothetically, this sounds like it might be there might be a worry, but not a an imminent worry that something might happen immediately that they might, you know, try and access some of these, you know, quote unquote lethal means. Um, do you have any advice? And then also, I guess I just want to tack on to that. Sorry again, that if it is a really an acute thing that someone believes is something that that is an immediate threat to their loved one, what you re might recommend, because we've seen, unfortunately, sometimes um, law enforcement, or maybe, I guess, first responders, quote unquote, aren't necessarily mental health professionals. So things can sometimes end in ways we don't want them to end. Right. Um, yeah. So the first thing I would say um, is that there's a lot of suicide prevention trainings out there, like QP, uh, QPR um, question. I'm blanking on the, the alphabet soup, Susan, but I think it's question, persuade, respond. I know they've changed a little bit from that. Um, and that there's other, if you're really wanting to sit with that, there's a lot available that is not necessarily reliant on police intervention. Um, at Families for Depression Awareness, we sort of define someone feeling suicidal as when their pain exceeds the coping skills that are available to them. It's not that there's something wrong with them or broken. It's just that the level of emotional, physical, spiritual pain that they are in right now is overriding you know, really their ability to save themselves, to, to think about wanting to be here and you know, potentially cutting them off from having hope. Um, so there's a lot of things out there that can be a support. One of the things that I've heard can be really helpful is, you know, it sounds like you don't have hope right now, but I'm going to hold that hope for you and me. And until you're able to have hope for you yourself again, I'm going to hold that hope for us. And we're going to get you back to a place where, you know, you can feel better and, and make a life worth living. Um, like you said, it's not like one thing that you can say, but really reminding them that you see the value in their life, even if it right now it does feel like things are too hard right now. I also want to, um, you know, 988 is beautiful and that's a great resource and I'm so glad getting suicide prevention uh, support is even easier. In the state of Massachusetts where we are, we know that only about 3% of calls are escalated to the point of police involvement. So getting to know um, where your you know, calls go to those call centers and getting a sense of how many of those calls are escalated. Um, but there's also trans uh, lifeline. So if your um, loved one has a different identity, um, you know, Trevor Project and LG, which serve LGBTQ youth, there's other resources for BIPOC um, communities, things that are in a person's language and Spanish. And so, you know, connecting them to resources that help them connect with their identity can also be really supportive. And as a caregiver, you can call those lines as well when you're worried to just ask for advice, what to say. Um, and crisis text line, if there's someone who texts, can be really helpful. A lot of these are volunteer run organizations. And so just reminding your loved one that they can advocate and say like, this service is not helping me. Like this volunteer is not helping me. They don't, they don't have to continue sitting with this person. Um, and I speak as someone who's lost a loved one um, from suicide and someone who's experienced suicidal ideation that it is hard. It's hard for everyone involved and, you know, it's a difficult period. So I, I hope that you can continue learning about this. And I'm glad that you're curious. Susan, what would you add? Um, just that, you know, sometimes uh, words are elusive and not really helpful, but being there can make a huge difference. Um, uh, acknowledging what they're going through is difficult and just really trying to get them the care and support that will help them. Uh, I think a lot of people feel, you know, again, really alone and 
there are resources there. Uh, I did want to add, you know, you had pointed out some um, demographics uh, specific support, but also for veterans, the, the um, 988 has an option for veterans and for um, families. So that's another resource for people. Yeah, I think it's just dialing one when you call in and they have translation services, um, but I think they're kind of limited to having like an intermediary person. But I know Crisis Text Line now has Spanish available and I'm pretty sure 988 does as well. Um, are we coming up on time, Calvin? Um, yeah, it looks like, but I was wondering if you had time for just one more question. I know yeah, we're right up uh, on our time limit right now. Yeah, I'm fine to stay for one more. Perfect. So this is a listener who um, who kind of wanted to tell her mom that she can't spend too much, you know, hours. She, she puts it in terms of hours um, with her just because her mom's depression. I'm sorry. I, I don't know if this is a um, I don't know this. So because um, their mom's um, anger and depression makes their own anger and depression worse. Mm. So so they have you know, they want to they want to be supportive of their mother. But also being in that environment can exacerbate their own anger and their own, I guess, depression. So what might you recommend in maybe terms of communicating with the mother or maybe um, other techniques so, so they can provide the care, but also they can take care of their own mental um, and emotional health? Yeah, I mean, I think it's great that this person's able to identify those triggers for themselves. I think that's a huge first step. And you're likely role modeling for your mom or that your family member that, you know, there are things that can, you know, affect me and affect you as well. Um, and I think that's where the support team can be really important because it can't rest on all, on you. Like there are times where we are going to need a break and, you know, there's respite services that are out there, you know, those warm lines that are out there, you know, if there's other family members or if they're part of a spiritual community, you know, who else could come and sit with them and helping them think that through. Like, I know I you know, we can support each other, but there's times where I might not be available to you. Who are the other people um, that you could go to in those moments. Let's make sure you have their resources available. Let's make sure they know they're those kinds of people for you. Um, I think that would be a good starting place, but definitely something that if you have a therapist or um, you know a family therapist to really be working on that together. Susan, anything you would include? I think that this is just um, reinforces the necessity for boundaries and being able to enforce them. You know, this is something that is harmful to you. Um, but that just should uh, motivate you to find the kinds of resources and supports that you need to make it that you can, you know, maintain a relationship even if it changes for a while. So um, I'm just putting a big thank you on the slides for folks. Um, and yeah, if, if more questions come up, I put my email in the chat where I'm available at ari at familywear.org. We also have webinars that are for free that we're going to be promoting in the near future and things that are also recorded on our website. So if you want to keep learning with us um, specifically about depression, bipolar disorder and your caregiving journey, we have lots of resources available. Thanks. You know, there's one last thing I wanted to ask about. The um, the toolkit, is that something they can find um, on your website? Yeah. So um, familywear.org slash trainings. We have all of our trainings listed and the resources that accompany them are with that. So the toolkit is one of our recorded trainings. So it's a similar version to this um, where we had one of our partners from Courage to Caregivers, Christy, and we interviewed her. So you can hear even more about her experience, which is another plug. Courage to Caregivers has online support groups. So if you are looking to connect uh, with more caregivers, that's a great way um, to connect. But yeah, everything is on our website. Okay, perfect. So again, you can um, um, email Ari if you did not uh, receive the toolkit or if the link didn't work. You can visit their website. Um, there's multiple ways to get the toolkit. So thanks again. Um, so yeah, it looks like we, um, we're out of time for today. I'd like to thank um, um, Ari and um, Susan for staying a little bit after. I do appreciate that. And of course, thanks everybody. I joined with our, our guest today. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, the Family Caregiver Alliance webinars are a free and continuing series. You can find more about Family Caregiver Alliance webinars on our website, caregiver.org. I am going to get a quick poll up if you have a quick moment to fill it out. We'd certainly appreciate any feedback, but I'll leave the line open a little bit after. So if um, 
if you have time um, to fill that out, we'd certainly appreciate it. So again, thanks for joining us. Um, and thank you, Susan and Ariel. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. It was really nice to connect with all of you. So everyone take care. Uh, I hope you're all well. And I certainly learned a lot today and I hope you did too. And we hope to see you next month.